In fact, we're going to, in about 10 seconds, start our, well, before, Steve, did you start it yet? All right. Well, good morning, everyone. How are you this morning? Good morning, Facebook, and all of our media family out there, Facebook. You know the, the drill. Send us a like and a heart. And below um, where you're seeing the, uh, the video, there's a little share button. If you would be so kind to share that, that'll help us get the word out. And also a little comment during the message would be good. Engage with us a little bit. Let us know you're on and where you're watching from. Even if you watch this later, we would love to know that you're on. Um, before we start, a couple things just want to go over. We've been having some real challenges. I'm kind of speaking to our Facebook family because Facebook has just been cutting off stuff, like cutting off our songs at the end. And it really, you know, you know, I tried to be led by the Lord to incorporate music to kind of embellish and just to help us be inspired with, you know, the messages and things that we've heard. Well, they've been cutting things off, and um, Marge has become really challenged in disputing things because we pay every year um, hundreds of dollars for a license to use this music in a church setting. So why they think they can just cut it off is... But we all know why. There's a lot of censorship going on, and it's probably not going to get better. But So I wanted to let Facebook know that there's going to be times, like today, we're going to end with a song, and so rather than cut off the teaching part in the midst of the song, we're just going to probably, you know, have to say goodbye and then so that we can continue in the service with the full account. So that means, Facebook, if you can come, you need to be here so you don't miss out on those things because you missed a great worship beginning today, I have to tell you. Um, how, can you just let Facebook know, we thank God. We thank God, right? Yes. Okay, so we love you. Just want you to know that. And... Um, also in here, just to be praying, you know, constantly be praying. we got to pray for our churches today because I'm telling you, Satan is just hovering, trying to find some way to distract, to close down, to censor, to, you know. So we got to really, really be in prayer for um, this glorious gospel to have its right standing. And the only way that's going to happen is when we stand up for the glorious gospel. Amen. So before we start, I want to say a big, giant, humongous thank you for helping celebrate my 35th birthday. <laughs> it was just great. Thank you so much. Um, all kidding aside, once again, your kindness, love, generosity, bless me beyond measure. There are no words. Again, for just how much you're appreciated and cared for, and I want you to know that your love gift is being uh, provided as a seed to go see some state, there's several that our family are dispersed within, um, that we are going to use that to go see them. We're going to go this weekend to see Melissa and our new grandson, so we're excited about that. And so from Ray and I and our whole family, thank you very, very much. I can't wait to get to 36. It's going to be really great. Anyway, well, today we're going to finish Chapter 7. Um, and you might think, oh, well, she's really moving through. There's 13 chapters. We're getting there. These are pithy pithy chapters. I don't know if you went ahead and read ahead from last week, but, you know, again, I just want to say, and against my opinion, and there's people who have different opinions, and, you know, when we get to heaven, they'll find out they were wrong. But anyway, um, this has to be Paul. Teresa and I were just dialoguing about that before we started today. You know, like she said, sometimes you read Paul's writings and go, just get to the point, right? <laughs> this, is, this book is so doctrinally deep, um, and sometimes the wording just is, is hard to understand. So today, this is one of those chapters. Today, what I'm, what I'm going to do is we're going to read through the New King James, which is where I study really from, but then I'm going to incorporate in some of those pithier areas the New Living Translation, just to give a more casual view, if you will, or a more everyday vernacular view. Um, I think you know what we're heading to. I had shared with you this whole chapter is really dealing with the better, the greater, the superiority of Christ as the better, greater, superior high priest. The high priest was, the, was just the watermark of the Jews. I mean, they couldn't access God without the priesthood. I mean, it was huge. I mean, for those of you who come from maybe a Roman Catholic background, you have a taste of that because there's a you know, a sacrament that's put in place there that, you know, your sin is forgiven by going and confessing. So you get a feel for that. That's an old covenant. That's an Old Testament um, tradition. 
So we're going to address some of that today, but just know that this whole chapter is dealing with Jesus Christ, the more superior high priest. Not to say that the high priests in the days of the law weren't, didn't have their place. They certainly did. But they were all just to show something later on. So we'll, we'll talk all about that. Next chapter we get to is going to talk about the better covenant. We're going to get a little taste in this chapter. The very first time the word covenant is used is going to be here in chapter 7. So we got a lot to cover. And I'm so thankful that you have hung. I'm so grateful. I see now why the Lord, remember the first week I was supposed to give you notes, and I didn't give you notes, and he said, I think I said to give him notes. And I can see why that is just so relevant, especially in this book, because there's just it's just going to help you to ingrain some of this into your hearts. When you write it, it does something. It, it, it just gets a little deeper. The more senses you use and the more you know, articulation of all of your senses put in play, the better that word is going to stay within you. And certainly in Hebrews, I am loving this book because it's, it's like going to Bible, st- Bible school. It's very doctrinally deep, and it's important for us to have that doctrine straightened out so that, as Paul said someplace else, we will have an answer for the hope that lies within us. Amen? So chapter 7, here we go. We've been learning about this high priest, um, the role of um, genealogy and the comparison of, of Jesus to, again, Israel's prior high priest. We've concluded that Jesus is a greater high priest because he was from the order of Melchizedek. That's a name that we entered into this chapter with, and we're going to continue to see that name throughout the chapter. Who was Melchizedek? Well, we know that he preceded and predated the Levitical priesthood. So he was prior, because we read about him. Tell me what chapters we read about him at. Only two in the Old Covenant. What are they? Genesis what? 14. What's the other one? This side. Psalm 110. Even though Jean was on the wrong side, that's okay. I'm going to have to move her over to the right side. Okay. Um, Yes, there's only two two places in Scripture where this man's name is mentioned. And yet here in Hebrews, he's mentioned eight times. So we need to really understand those two places in order to understand the revelation that is coming from the concealed part that we saw in the Old Testament. So we concluded that this Jesus, this greater, superior, better high priest, is better because he is from a greater high priest. He's from the Mechizeldech if you will, order, okay, which predated what? What order? Levitical order, amen. And we concluded that scripture, in scripture, that Melchizedek was not Shem. Shem was a son of Noah. The table of nations, which we showed last week, if you weren't here, catch the YouTube, rather than listen, because you'll see that there. But Shem was one of the sons of Noah. And in a sense, the the whole, all the nations came out of that ship at stopping, them getting off board, and then the, you know, the, the uh, begetting of all of those sons created nations. And Shem, as you can see, I can see the light behind me. I thought it was Jesus standing behind me. But um, Shem lends itself to eventually getting down to a very familiar name, Abraham. And Abraham was the father of what? The father of the Jews, right? And so we know that now Shem, and a lot of Jews think that, indeed, that this Melchizedek in Genesis 14 was Shem. We concluded that by scripture that it's not Shem. We concluded that it's not a type of Christ, that Melchizedek was not Shem, a type of Christ, but instead he was a Christology, a Christophany or a a theophany, literally, literally Christ incarnate, in person at that time. That's what we concluded, not because it's what I'd like it to be, but because we searched scripture and we found some places that took us to that place. So again, listen or re-listen to last week's message um, on how we came to that conclusion. So now we're going to pick up and we're going to continue to delve deeper in why he is a better high priest and why there is even a need. Why was there even a need for a better? Why just couldn't we just keep the system the way it was? Gee, it seemed to work for thousands of years for them. Well, I think by the end of today that you'll understand that. So, Lord, we just bow our heads before you. 
Um, and while our heads are bowed, we open up our hearts. We declare by placing our hands on our heart that this is good ground, that this word, this incorruptible seed, which you call your word, we declare that, that it's going to be planted in good heart, good heart and good soil that will produce, Lord. We thank you that we're not just going to be busy knowing this, we're going to be fruitful after we hear it, Lord, and that we'll have the hope and have the answer for the hope that lies within us. So we just give you praise that you are, you made sure that everything in the kingdom is better, more superior, and greater than it ever was. And I thank you that you never change, so it's never going to get worse. Amen. It's going to stay better. And we just thank you for that in Jesus' precious name. We'll start out with verse 11. Here we go. Therefore, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, because the law was supposedly, they thought, would make them perfect and acceptable before God, right? For under it, the people received the law. What further need was there that another priest should arise according to the order of who? Melchizedek. And not be called according to the order of Aaron. Okay? So if Aaron, Aaron was the very first high priest of Israel, Anybody that came from Aaron's loins, that was the priesthood. It was the only tribe that were called to be the priesthood in Israel. Started with Aaron, and it went forward. So if Aaron and his descendants, his sons and so forth, were all that and a bag of bagels, <laughs> why would we need another high priest? Prophesied that it would happen in Psalm 110. The only other place besides Genesis 14, Psalm 110.4, when David wrote that psalm, he was bringing a messianic, prophetic word into that psalm. Why, why would he say that and why do we need it? Remember that that, that, that psalm, Psalm 110.4, it's messianic. A thousand years it was written after that first Christophany, that first theophany, that first visitation of Christ himself who showed up as Mel Melchizedek, okay? And remember, again, it's so important if you weren't here to listen to last week because this kind of is the backdrop to where we're going today. So um, it's, he, it was messianic. He was speaking of what was yet to come, amen? And so if that Levitical priesthood was perfect, he's saying here, why did God even mention another priestly order? So let's Keep 11, and let's begin to add to it. So we'll read 11 and 12 together. Therefore, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law. So we see there's this, there's this coupling that you can't separate the priesthood away from the law because it was part of it. What is the law? Who knows what the law is? Not just the Ten Commandments. What's the law? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, right? The five books of Moses. That's the law we're talking about, or the Torah. What further need was there that another priest should rise according to this order of Melchizedek and not be called in order, according to the order of Aaron? Verse 12. For the priesthood being changed of necessity, then there's also a need to change the law. See, you can't separate the two because the Levitical priesthood was connected to the law. So you can't just take that out and change that and just leave this here like, oh, that's okay now because once there's a flaw in something, then the whole thing is flawed. It becomes non-perfect anymore, right? So if the tribe of Levi is not going to offer perfection for the people, then the law that gave us Levi must also be replaced. Think about that which we now know, as we sit here some 2,000 years later, which we now know is what? Now we know is, a, is another dispensation of time. It's the dispensation of grace. That's what replaced, or what we call the new covenant. Now you get a glimpse on why Paul said it's a new and better covenant, because it has better promises. Why? Because we have a better high priest. Amen? Now, this is told to us, not just me putting pieces together, but Scripture validates this because in John 1, 17, it says, for the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. 
So it's another dispensation of time, another situation that's taking point. So this is the point he's making here. Okay, is everyone with me? We're going to eliminate the Levitical priesthood and substitute another one since it was part of the law, then we got to replace the law too. Let's go a little deeper, verses 13 through 19. For he of whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe. Who's he speaking of? Yes. For which no man has officiated at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord arose from where? Judah. He didn't come from the Levitical priesthood. He came from the tribe of Judah, right? It's evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which the tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning the priesthood. And is it yet far more evident if, in the likeness of Melchizedek, there arises another priest who has come not according to the law of a fleshly commandment, but according to the power of an endless life? For he testifies, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Again, quoting Psalm 110, verse 4, a thousand years before it ever happened. Okay? For on the one hand, there is an annulling of the former commandment or a doing away because of its weakness and its unprofitableness. For the law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, there is the bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. Let's, let's look at this in the New Living. I want to start from the very beginning, 11 through 19, or through 17, through 19, in the New Living, just so you can see it from another word base. So if the priesthood of Levi, in which the law was based, could have achieved the perfection God intended, why did God need to establish a different priesthood with a priest in the order of Melchizedek instead of the order of Levi and Aaron? We got that, right? And if the priesthood is changed, then the law must also be changed to permit it. For the priest we are talking about belongs to a different tribe whose members have never served at an altar as priests. What I mean is our Lord came from the tribe of Judah. They never served in the altar in the tabernacle or temple because they weren't allowed to. Only Levites could do that, right? And Moses never mentioned priests coming from that tribe. This change has been made very clear since a different priest who was like Melchizedek has appeared. Jesus became a priest not by meeting the physical requirement of belonging to the tribe of Levi, but by the power of a life that cannot be destroyed. And the psalmist pointed this out when he prophesied, and here we go, Psalm 110.4, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Well, you are means he's present then and there because Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So not only is this a prophecy to the future, it's an establishment of his presence at that very moment when it's being said, okay? Yes, the old requirement about the priesthood was set aside because it was weak and useless, for the law never made anything perfect. But now we have confidence in a better hope through which we draw near to God. See, the new living, I think, kind of maybe filled in some of those wording situations. So the tribe of Levi is the traditional tribe of the priestly line. We've been over that several times. Aaron, again, being the first high priest, and every priest after him had to be from his loins. Okay? That's, that's how it had to be. Listen, it was a hereditary position. There was no oath put over them. They didn't have to go to the seminary. It, it, it's just where it all came from. It was a hereditary position. And these priests were, to, were, to, were the link for Israel to get to God. They were the entire bridge, if you will. They were the entire hinge pin. To, for them to be able to get to God. And these Jews were freaking out as they're hearing, who I think is Paul here, talking about this and thinking out loud because they're thinking in their mind, no, 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 no. We need Levites to get to God. We need Levites. Who was this guy? How can he fulfill thousands of years of, of dressed up guys? Incense and ha ya ya and hoo ha ha, right? How could he possibly do that? 
That's what they're thinking. They're like freaking out thinking about this. And the writer is saying here, no, 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 no. Let me bring you to remembrance a thousand years ago when David said, verse 17, and the psalmist pointed out this when he prophesied, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. So you got to bring them back to this wonderful king over Israel that they all know and love. So he's saying there's a higher priesthood and it's from this Melchizedek line which again, I'm just, I know I'm hammering the same thing over, but I want you to get this, which preceded, preceded Levi. It was before the law, okay? See, the priests were temporary. They wanted to make them permanent. The role is permanent, but who he used was temporary. The purpose of the law, according to Galatians, was placed to lead us to Christ so that we would be justified not by the law, right, but by faith in Christ. We're probably going to go to Galatians after this because I think it's a, a great coupling of, of this misconception of scooting back to doing right thing. And we do that in church unintentionally. We have this idea, well, if you do that, well, are you really a Christian? Because we go to the works mentality, yeah. Right? It's a position, not necessarily behavior and position would be nice if it was all together, but we, we fall short. We fall short at times, amen? So the law, when we went all through this, when he said the law just was imperfect, all the law did was, was to expose my need for a savior. That was it. That was it. It was just to expose my need for a savior. The law had a purpose excuse me for the graphicness of this, to fillet me open and expose my sin and my sinful tendencies. So its purpose was to expose my need for a savior. I think that's one of your um, little blanks to fill in. And the law had a, had, it was, it was there. It, was, it had a purpose to, to open me up so that I could see for myself my own sins and my own sin tendencies. The law can't save us. It was only there to expose us. That's it. But they made it their vessel of a relationship rather than see it as their flaw and unable to keep it because it reflected the perfection of God. And nobody's perfect and nobody can ever be perfect. And so it was just there to show you you can't be perfect. It was the teacher to do that. And so this is what is being said from here through verse 19 that we just read. Now, Verse 20 and 24, we're going to read New King James. And again, I'm going to go back to the New Living so you get a little better taste of the words of it. And inasmuch as he was not made priest without an oath, for they had become priests without an oath, but he with an oath by him who said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not relent. Again, quoting Psalm 110, verse 4, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. We're going to get back to this oath situation. Bear with me. By so much more, Jesus has become a surety. What's the word surety mean? A guarantee. You know, the old covenant says, don't, take, don't give surety to somebody financially, right? Um, so he's become a guarantee of a better, there's the first time you see the word covenant in the book of Hebrews. Also, there were many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing. They died. Okay, They were humans. At some point, they died. But he, capital H, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood, an unchangeable priesthood. Now, let's see it in the New Living Translation. This new system, New Covenant, was established by a solemn oath. Aaron's descendants became priests without an oath. But there was an oath regarding Jesus. For God said to him, the Lord has taken an oath and will not break his veil. You are a priest forever. And because of this oath, Jesus is the one who guarantees this better covenant with God. There were many priests under the old system, for death prevented them from remaining in the office. They just had to keep getting new ones, right? But because Jesus lives forever, his priesthood lasts forever. 
That's awesome. He was made a priest with an oath. All of Israel's priesthood, they didn't make an oath at all. They didn't take a course. They didn't earn their degree in Levitical priesthood, right? They didn't take a test to pass it. None of that. There was no oath. If you were a son of Aaron, you were a priest. I like how the Holy Spirit gave it to me. It was all about linkage to lineage. It was all about linkage to lineage. It had nothing to do with a promise over anything. To, to some essence, there was in the law that they would come from this tribe, but not one of them, not one single one of them was given an oath. It was just the lineage that they carry to be a part of it. Amen? So Psalm 110, again, quotes here. Let me put it into a little language you can understand. Yahweh said to Adonai, father to son, I'm making an oath to you, okay? I'm giving you a promise. You're a priest forever. So the oath was from Yahweh. To the Son, Yahweh to Adonai, it came to. Jesus has replaced any, oh, listen, hear me, Facebook, media, family, those here in, in, as we're here together. What is, Jesus has replaced any and all priesthoods and systems of priesthoods. Church, we still have churches with priesthoods in place. This is a violation of chapter 7 of Hebrews. And I'm not here to be super critical of some name on a billboard out front, but I'm just giving you the Bible here. Jesus has done away. Jesus has replaced. And because he's replaced, they're all done with. He's replaced the systems of priesthood. Can I tell you, you want some good news? We're all called priests and kings now. Because we all carry the gospel. We all carry the good news. Right? We're a chosen generation. Tell me what else we are. A royal priesthood. Now that's going to get some religious cows a little upset. Because we like position and titles and walking around with hats and things and whatnot. Well, you know, the Lord said, wash some feet, and that's your title now. You know, and bring people into the kingdom. So again, I can't emphasize enough. Jesus has replaced any and all priests and systems of that priesthood. Verse 24 says he has an unchangeable priesthood. Or another translation said a permanent priesthood. It's permanent. It's never going to go back to the way it was, and it's never going to change again. He has finally fulfilled all of what it was meant to be, and there's no need for anybody or anything else. So important to know that. There will never be a replacement because Jesus is perfect. He's perfect, and there's nothing newer or better than perfect. Amen? Amen. Going to the home stretch, we read verses 25 through 28. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him. That's why the old system of priesthood has been replaced because we don't go through man anymore. There's a man that sits at the right hand of the Father. There's a man in the Godhead. So we don't need any men here because we got him. You need to chew on that. Since he always lives to make intercession for them. Mark that in your Bibles. We're going to come back to it. For such a high priest was fitting for us who was holy. We're talking about Jesus. Harmless, defiled, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens who does not need daily, as those high priests, to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once and for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints as high priests men who have weaknesses. That was the priesthood of, of Israel. 
But the word of oath, Yahweh to Adonai, which came after the law, appoints the son who has been perfected forever. Those words like forever and never to change. And these, these are the words we're seeing so closely in this book, right? I love this, the very beginning when it says he saves us to the uttermost. And I remembered and looked it up. Uh, Billy Sunday made a, made, used to make, he was an evangelist and he made this statement saying that he saves us from the guttermost. Oh. Love that. Some say, boy, look at this first verse. Therefore, he's able to save us from the guttermost, right? To the uttermost. Those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. He always lives to make intercession for us. I was thinking about this. You know, I've heard people say, you've heard people say, I just live for the beach. Or, or I just live for football season. Not if you watch the Eagles, you don't. But anyway, <laughs> or whatever. But here, Jesus says, you know what I live for? I live forever interceding for you. What, what a beautiful, beautiful picture that is. I forever live interceding for you until we meet him face to face. And by the way, when he intercedes for us, by the way, he's not appeasing an angry God like, oh God, yeah, hold it. Remember Moses. Moses had to stand in the gap for the Israelites. Oh, don't take them out, God. What about your reputation? You, you know, Jesus is not holding God's anger back. You know why? Because he took all the anger that would be upon us Amen. to him. Jesus took it. Amen. So he's not appeasing his anger all that, was, all that was dealt with on the cross, amen? amen? Where God poured out, poured out the punishment for all of our sins and the wrath of God on Christ. Some of us have this vision that like, you know, if God's in a good mood or a bad mood that day, whether he's going to throw the gavel on us. Listen, God is always in a good mood amen. when it comes to you. Hallelujah. He's always happy when he thinks about you. Amen. Right? When he sees Sachiko come in with her little tree of life necklace or whatever she's got, he just, come here, come here, I want you to see her. Could you come, come here, heaven, look at that girl. He's always in a good mood. He's always smiling when he looks upon us because there's nothing to not smile about anymore. Church, ladies, my sisters, when he looks at you, he doesn't see sin. It's gone. He don't see sin whatsoever because it's already been seen upon Jesus. It, it's, it's a miracle. It's just, it's beyond words. Like, there's so many different ways you can come at this. And every single time you just go, wow, wow, ooh, it, it's amazing. It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. And, and so he's not doing that. Listen, to, to, to prove that, what, what does Jesus pray for us about? Well, we got to go back a little bit, a little taste of it, back to Luke 22, which we studied not too long ago, when at the end of the chapter, 23, 22, something like that, he said to him, Simon, Simon, Satan has desired to sift you like wheat. And what did Jesus say to Peter? But I've been praying but I'm praying. It's not interceding to hold God's wrath back. No, Satan is out to get you, Peter and Joni and Phyllis and Steve and Teresa. He's out. While, while God never has a bad day and never is in a bad mood, on the other hand, Satan never has a good day. <laughs> he never has a good day. He's always, every single day, has a mission as the destroyer, a murderer, a liar. And that's what Jesus is interceding and praying about on our prayer. Right now, right now, we're having this meeting and you got here today because Jesus was praying for you. Amen. He was praying that our... You know, that the, that the eyes of our understanding would be open, that we would know the hope of our calling, that we would know the depth, the life, the width, and the call of God in our lives and the love that surpasses all understanding. Whew, that warms my heart. 
that God Almighty in the flesh is praying, praying for you and praying for me. And and one, one more beautiful thing to know is this. But when we get to heaven, we are going to find out just how potent and powerful his prayers were for us. When we see and when we find out what would have come our way, but didn't. What should have come our way, but didn't. When Satan wanted to take Barbara Evans at an accident and take her out of here, but Jesus was praying. That's going to be one of the things we're going to... There's so many things... What are we going to do for all eternity? There's more than we can imagine. But one of the things is we're going to see the potent and powerful prayers that Jesus interceded on our behalf and the praise that's going to erupt out of that. That's going to take a few billion years. Because some of you got saved from a lot. Right? Mm. Mm Mm-mm-mm. What should have come your way? What could have come your way? But what didn't oh, come your yeah. way? Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah is right. Amen. Amen. And then we move into verse 26, and we see this description of him. So after he says he lives to intercede for us, then he goes on to say, for such a high priest was fitting for us who was holy, harmless, undefiled, separated from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens. You know, we don't want to bypass that verse 26 because this is, this is some description of who Jesus is and some different wording than probably we've seen in other places in Scripture. Amen? So, holy and harmless. Holy but not mean. See, because sometimes, I, I don't know, sometimes I've met people who, who present themselves holy and they're very grouchy, uh, yeah. grouches. Uh, right? A- anybody know some holy grouches? Uh, yeah. <laughs> we got to be careful not to get so holy that we get grouchy and grumpy, right? And become pew grouches, right? No, he's holy but harmless. Holy, but not mean. He's, he doesn't, he never gets mad. He never gets mad at you. He is forever, he gets mad at, at I'm sure, at, at Satan and his assignments, right? But he doesn't get mad at you. What, what a comfort that is. What a comfort that is. He's never mad at you. He's never so mad that he's angry at any of us. And we have this picture of God, don't we? Like he's just up there looking down. What's she going to do today? You know? No. No, he's praying. He's praying that we're going to move along and we're going to grow and we're going to be we're going to be fruitful and not just busy. You have to be here Sundays to understand Amen. what that means. But yeah, he's doing just that. Not only that, but he's undefiled and a friend of sinners. He was called that by the sinners themselves, right? Listen, he, he was undefiled, and he, it says here that he was separate from sinners, but he was a friend to sinners. Undefiled and separate, but yet a friend to them all the way, and higher than the heavens. How, how can we comprehend that? How can something be higher than the heavens? The high of heavens are higher than anything there is. It's just, these are the kind of things that you do, your, your mind, your heart just can't comprehend what this would be like. But it did remind me of a scripture, maybe you're familiar with it too. Philippians 2 9 says, Therefore God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name that is named. That means whatever name has been put on you. Jesus has a name that's higher than that name. Whether it's a sickness, a disease, uh, an emotional attribute, there's a name higher and more powerful. Amen? Amen. Matthew 28 says, all authority, all authority has been given to me in earth and in heaven, it says. 
And then Ephesians goes on to tell us that we should pray this way. Ephesians 1, 21 and 22 says that he's been given a position far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named. Not only in this age, but the age that is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the angels. To, this, to the church. To the church. We're asking Jesus to do some things we're supposed to be doing. We're asking Jesus to take authority over these things when he's given us the authority to take over those things. Isn't that amazing? This is, our, this is, this is what we're supposed to be doing. We, are the feet part of the body? If he's put it under his feet, then it's under us. Mm. So let's capstone this chapter. Let's capstone it. The priesthood of Jesus precedes and transcends any and all priestly systems. The priesthood of Jesus Christ, it precedes and it transcends any and all priestly systems. That's a mouthful. And again, remember, this is early Jews in the early church who have followed this, honored this, participated in this. This is a major, major change. And it is to some even today because the word has life generations later. Because again, some are, are involved with a worship system that is utilizing something that Jesus said has passed, that he's the fulfillment of now. Two, Jesus was before the priesthood was ever established among men. We know because Genesis 14 tells us that he met Melchizedek, or that Abraham met Christ Melchizedek, and he gave him tithes, and he honored him, and all these kind of things. So the point is that, that Jesus was before the priesthood was ever established among men. That didn't happen until the law was given. And he is greater than any priest among men. I think we just spent the whole hour together today defining and establishing that. And finally, I'm here to let you know and reiterate, the earthly priestly system has passed away. The earthly priestly system has passed away. We no longer need or should go to an earthly man or woman to access God for anything or about anything. Why? Because Jesus is our permanent and forever high priest. Right? The earthly priestly system has passed away. We no longer need to go to an earthly man or woman to access God for anything, about anything, because Jesus is our permanent and forever high priest. Go a little deeper. Why else? Because only Jesus can stand before a holy God and sinful humanity and bridge that gap forever. Not just, he's not ever going to die because he forever lives to intercede for us, right? See, they died at some point. He forever does this. Only Jesus can reconcile man to God. Only Jesus can atone for sins, not with bulls, goats, sheep, and lambs, but with his own sacrifice. He didn't bring a specimen. He was the specimen. So that makes him greater, doesn't it? Only Jesus, not another priest or victor or any human being, can hear my confessions and forgive me for my sin. Nobody but Jesus Christ can do that. Nobody. Would you say with me, only Jesus? Only Jesus. Look at your neighbor and tell them, only Jesus. Only Jesus. Uh, let's shout it. Only Jesus. Only Jesus. It says in verse 25, and we can bring that back up, Marge. It says in verse 25, that he makes intercession for such a high priest was fitting for us who was holy, harmless, undefiled, 
separate from sinners, has become higher than the heavens, who does not need a daily as those high priests to offer sacrifices, first for his own and then for the people. For this he did, look at this, for this he did, verse 27, once and for all. Once and for all. That's why the earthly priesthood system is done. Because the word tells us it was once and for all. He offered himself, not bringing perfect specimens. He was the perfect specimen. And he offered once. You know, and, and, and I want to just, because just, we're going to prepare to have some communion together. But I, I just want to say, and I, and I want to be careful saying this. I want to be biblically correct and not critical. But it may come across a little critical because sometimes to be biblically correct, then something has to be put aside so that the truth arises. Amen? I, I personally disagree with my Roman Catholic friends who, when they gather, they celebrate the Mass, which is a repeating of Christ's sacrifice. Yeah. Am I understand that right? Those who have that background, it's a repeating. It's not a once and for all. It's an over and over and over again repeating of Christ's sacrifice, right? Every time we go to Mass, and every time the Mass is given, it's repeating Christ's crucifixion. I, am I right? So, because of that, there is a belief in something called transubstantiation. Transubstantiation which is that this element is the literal, the real, the actual blood of Jesus Christ in here. And this is literally and actually his literal, literal body. Transubstantiation means literal. It's literally that, okay? And that's why... That's why the priest needs to drink all of the wine. It, right, Gene? Yeah. Has to drink all of the wine because it's consecrated as his blood. So we can't just leave it somewhere. So he has to leave all the wine there. He can't leave any behind. And that's why sometimes the priest can get a little tipsy because if the mass doesn't have a lot. See, I got some Catholics here. They know what I'm talking about. Am I right, Gene? They can get a little tipsy because they got to drink it all. If only one person comes to Mass, they got the whole bottle. <laughs> Can't leave any behind. So, Hebrews says, Christ died once. Christ died once. Not over and over and over and over again. Each time Mass happens and consecration takes place, it only happened once. But let me be equally truthful as we leave not just Roman Catholic but Episcopalian also believe in, in, in transubstantiation finally said it um, but let me just say for my fellow Protestants I also don't believe it's just to remember now Jesus said do this in remembrance of me so there's a portion of taking me that we have to go back to look at what he did so there is a portion but it's not only to remember Okay? I mean, what I'm saying is it's more than a cracker and a juice. And some of us have been in churches where there's not much emphasis put upon it. You know, it's like maybe drag that table out once a month and we do this in remembrance of me. And, and I'm sure there's some holiness that's done there, but it's, it's a once a month thing. And maybe subconsciously we might, I know I did coming from the the, the source and foundation I came from, well, it must not be that important if you only do it once a month. Boy, is that ever so wrong. Is that ever so wrong? It's more than a cracker and juice to remember. Again, most churches do it monthly, and because of that, it can be just come a tradition and very common. We here have the Lord's table, and I'm not saying I have the right thing of everything, available every time we gather. Why? because I think it's more important than just remembering. It is remembering, but there's something else to it. And it's definitely not the repeating of Christ's death each time we gather. It is not to take Christ to the cross every time we gather. It's not repeating, and it's not only remembering. Can I tell you what it is? It's receiving. Yeah. Oh, that's a big turn. See, you can just remember all you want, but if, it, if you don't receive what the remembrance 
brings to us to receive, then it will be tradition. It'll be just like the nice story we read over in Deuteronomy, and oh yeah, that was Noah. No, it's an ongoing lifeline for you. It's an ongoing vessel where we just remember and we receive what we remember. So we can't just remember, we need to receive it, right? Let let me give you an example. I had the most adorable birthday cake this year that was, it was a high heel. It was a high heel birthday cake. And on February 11th, I had a piece of the high heel birthday cake. And I had a piece of the birthday cake on February 12th. (laughs) And I had a piece of the birthday cake on February 13th. And you know where I'm going. On February 14th, I had a piece of that birthday cake on that day too. What am I saying as we're talking about this? Four days later, I ate the same cake. (laughs) There wasn't a rebaked cake every single day. I just received what was already there in celebration. Amen? Amen. And I had to go to it and remember it was there (laughs) in order to receive it. But I went to the same source over and over and over to receive what I remember. And church, I hope that's a new picture of the Lord's table to you today. And it shouldn't be once a month. You know, and again, I'm not critical of any church. They're called to do what they're called to do. They'll hear from the Lord. What I do want to say to you is no matter what your church does or doesn't do, you need to go frequently to the Lord's table. You need to have set up in your home where you are, you go often. Because it's a place to receive. It's a place to receive his word. It's a place to receive who Jesus is in in our life. It's a place to receive what he's done, the sins that have been paid for, the healing by his stripes, the deliverance he's taken you out of darkness, receiving the, the imparting of his presence and his power. I I think we need to do that more than once a month, don't you think? Not re-crucifying, not just symbolic and remembering but receiving what still is flowing from the resurrected Savior and his empowered life. Amen? Amen. Let's take and go to the Lord's table with that revelation in mind today. So you go ahead and prepare that. More just going to play us a little music. that 
extra mile, and he took stripes upon his back. Isaiah 53 said, and by his stripes we are healed. And Peter 2.4 says, 1 Peter 2.4 says, and by his stripes we were healed. That means at the cross, when he bore those stripes, healing was settled. We're not trying to get healed. It was settled just like our sins were settled. So as you take the bread, take the exchange. Receive. Remember, it's not to re-crucify. It's not even just to remember. But it's to remember to receive. So receive. Father, we lift this bread.